first at four, we're tracking a shakeup in the medical team guiding Michigan through the COVID-19 pandemic. What we've learned so far. The national spotlight shines on Oakland Community College. We'll talk about what brought First Lady Dr. Jill Biden to Royal Oak. Paul. Oh, it's turned into a finally fabulous Friday. We really deserved it after the week we just had, but there is trouble in the offing. Here's a cold front coming. That's going to affect part of our weekend. I'm going to break that down for you straight ahead. Priya. If you've driven through southwest Detroit, no doubt you've seen these hand-painted murals. Tonight, we're taking a deep dive in how these murals are preserving and celebrating Latino culture. Local 4 News starts now with a breaking news alert. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Karen Drew. That breaking news concerns one of the key figures who has been leading Michigan through the COVID-19 pandemic. Chief Medical Executive Dr. Janae Caldoun is moving on. We got word this afternoon Dr. Caldoun has accepted a new position outside of state government. So far, we're not getting any details on that new job. Caldoun was side by side with Governor Gretchen Whitmer for the many COVID updates over the past 18 months. She always handled the data and the medical questions during the crisis. Governor Whitmer has appointed Dr. Natasha Bogdazarian to replace Caldoun starting October 1st. Now she's described as a world renowned expert who's been working at the state health department as a senior public health physician. We're gathering more on this critical transition. We'll have an update at five. Dearborn police are investigating the death of a man who was confronted by a police officer last night. The altercation happened at the Falcon Inn on Michigan Avenue around 830. Police responded to calls for help and were told a man was holding a door shut, preventing someone from leaving. Police described that 38 year old Livonia man as agitated. A struggle ensued. He became unresponsive. The fire department administered first aid, but the man died at the hospital. The officer is on administrative duty this afternoon, pending the outcome of that investigation. First Lady Dr. Jill Biden in Metro Detroit today as part of the return to school road trip. The First Lady arrived at Metro Airport about noon for her first visit to Michigan since May. Biden then delivered remarks at an event in Royal Oak at Oakland Community College. Biden talked about the importance of the president's Build Back Better agenda to education that includes two years of free community college. Community colleges are founded on the idea that no matter where we are, no matter where we come from or what struggles we've faced, all of us have the potential to grow and learn, to pursue fulfilling careers and give back to our communities if only we are given the opportunity. The First Lady was joined at today's event by U.S. Secretary of Education Miguel Cardona and Congressman Andy Levin. Republican organizers of a new election reform petition have cleared one hurdle to get a proposal on the Michigan ballot. The Michigan Elections Board has approved a 100-word summary for that petition. Now, organizers need to round about 340,000 valid signatures to place it on the ballot. Among other things, the proposal would tighten the rules for absentee and in-person voting. If it's approved by voters, Governor Whitmer would not be able to veto the legislation. New at 5, we'll dig deeper into what the legislation would require and why critics are blasting the idea. Well, it's been an interesting 24 hours as the CDC issued new guidelines for COVID booster shots from Pfizer. An advisory committee was voting this time yesterday on its recommendation, but the director of the CDC went beyond what that panel wanted to do. Jason Colthorpe runs through who has the green light for a third shot. Jason. Yeah. Karen, good afternoon. Anyone who meets the requirements for the Pfizer booster can go get that third shot right away. If you receive the Moderna or Johnson & Johnson vaccine, you'll have to wait. The big change from CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky dealt with frontline workers like doctors, nurses, and teachers. The advisory panel narrowly rejected boosters for those folks, but Walensky disagreed, so now they are eligible, along with people 65 and older, long-term care residents, and people ages 50 to 64 with underlying conditions. And some Americans 18 to 49 years old with chronic health problems also qualify. These groups can get a booster six months after their second dose. Today, the CDC director explained why she veered from the panel's wishes. In an effort to protect those at greatest risk, our initial vaccine rollout prioritized these individuals, the everyday heroes of our society. 
Our healthcare systems are once again at maximum capacity in parts of the country. Our teachers are facing uncertainty as they walk into the classroom, and I must do what I can to preserve the health across our nation. It's hard to acknowledge I'm over 65, but I'll be getting my booster shot. <laughs> it's a bear, isn't it? I tell you, acknowledge. Anyway, but all kidding aside, I'll be getting my booster shot. I'm not sure exactly when I'm going to do it as soon as I can get it done. President Biden was quick to encourage those eligible to get their booster shots, as you heard there. At one point, the president hoped all adults would be eligible, but the FDA and CDC felt it was too soon to say the benefits of third shots for all adults outweigh any potential risks. Karen, we'll keep you posted on guidance for those who receive the other vaccines. But for now, back to you. All right. Always appreciate it. Thanks, Jason. Well, Michigan seems to be stuck when it comes to new COVID cases. The state reports more than 6,000 in the past two days. It's an estimated daily average of a little more than 3,000, practically the same number we saw back on Wednesday. We're also reporting 82 additional deaths, including 56 identified during a records review. The seven-day positive testing rate is just under 9%. All right, uh, let's check in on the first forecast of Friday evening looking pretty good, but we could see some rain later. Let's send it over to Fall Gross. Yeah, we're going to try and hold off that rain until late at night, so we're not going to have any problems for this evening. And let's do some four zone weather. And how about in our metro zone? We have mid 70s here in Detroit, in Taylor, not far behind Livonia and Troy. It's 73 degrees. Canton, you're at 71. Down in our south zone, we have 72 in Dundee, 75 in Carlton. How about that? 74 in Monroe and 73 beautiful degrees in Deerfield. In our west zone, 77 in Ipsy. That's been reading a little high lately, so I'm a little suspect on that. But still, 72 in Ann Arbor, 71 in Whitmore Lake, Milford, you're at 69 degrees and in our north zone it's mostly 60s we do have a 70 here at Port Huron we have 20 Celsius that's 68 Fahrenheit in uh, Sarnia 66 in Deckerville and 71 right now in Lapeer and as I showed you before we have nothing going on here but this cold front is going to be coming in tomorrow morning we'll break that down for you in about 10 minutes or so but for the ball game tonight clear and calm and beautiful the wind settling down a bit temps falling into the 60s I'll be back with that weekend forecast in just a bit Karen all right thank you Paul Police reveal new information in the deadly mass shooting at a Kroger in Collierville, Tennessee. Police say the alleged gunman, a 29-year-old man, was a third-party vendor at the store. In total, 10 of the victims were store employees, five were customers. One customer, Olivia King, died from her injuries. According to police, the gunman also died from an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. Investigators believe they know the motive, but have not made it public yet. Congress is headed for a showdown over a possible government shutdown, which could happen in just six days. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer plans a procedural vote Monday on a House pass plan to keep the government open. It is likely to fail because it also raises the debt limit, which is something Republicans oppose. The U.S. already owes more than $28 trillion, but not raising the limit could cause a financial crisis. The White House Budget Office has already warned several agencies to start preparing for a possible shutdown. Government funding is set to run out on September 30th. Now the story of a cultural celebration that's been brightening Southwest Detroit since the 1960s. We're going to take you to the neighborhood where a series of murals tells deeply personal stories of the families who live there. Our Priya Mann continues our coverage focusing on National Hispanic Heritage Month. There's about 40 murals across Southwest Detroit. The vast majority were painted in just the past decade. We spoke to a lifelong Detroiter, grandmother, and historical author about how these murals are celebrating Latino culture. Despite all the chaos and all that, that's been thrown at us over the last 10 years, we're still here and we're still thriving. Mexican town has long been synonymous with Southwest Detroit, a vibrant community with immigrants from Mexico, Puerto Rico, Cuba, and Central America. Their rich history captured in murals painted throughout town. What they're painting is their life, their experiences. They're telling a story. So there's stories being told throughout Southwest Detroit and Mexican town through murals. These murals have exploded over the last decade, fueled largely by young artists. Stephanie Falchak is passionate to contribute. And you could just drive through Southwest Detroit and just see every building has color. It's a part of this neighborhood. Preserving culture, promoting economic opportunities and connecting people to one another. You have some wonderful traditions. You have the mariachis, you have the bright colored flags that are painted on there like like a fiesta. The history of Mexican town is captured on every street corner. The original La Jaliciencia 
tortilla factory. They opened their doors in the early 30s and they have this beautiful mural that represents the the cornfields, and that's representative of corn tortillas. Many communities didn't survive the Great Recession of 2008, but that wasn't the case here. Believe it or not, we had a thousand additional businesses open, and they're still open. And, and I attribute that to a lot of them are recent immigrants, and a lot of them struggle to get across the border. I mean, a lot of them, what they have gone through to struggle to get all the way up here to Detroit Opening a business is a piece of cake. Nevertheless, the Latino community still battles stereotypes, but this art form is breaking down misconceptions. We're not holding back or we're not hiding. We're expressing who we are and the love we have for color, for nature, for for festivities, for love of family. Making a statement and sending a message through this labor of love. Pushing that awareness that these communities are here and they're thriving and they're beautiful, that's the point and to not forget. Unless you're in Mexico, Maria says the goodies don't get more authentic than this. She's encouraging everyone to come down, get some food, check out the artwork and connect with the people who live here during National Hispanic Heritage Month. In Southwest Detroit, I'm Priya Mann, Local 4. Thank you, Priya. Maria authored a book called Images of America, Detroit's Mexican Town in 2011. It takes an in-depth look into the history of Southwest Detroit and its bright future. Make sure to watch for more stories celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month right here on Local 4. Still ahead at 4, a giant retailer throws a curveball into holiday shopping for thrifty shoppers. A popular program ends and we're going to take a look at the alternative which cost a lot more. Also a new proposal that could make life more difficult for unruly passengers on airplanes. What Delta is asking other airlines to think about. First, the miracle house in the middle of a volcano disaster. We'll see the drone video next.